it's Friday, TGIF. Good morning to everyone. Good morning to all our presenters. Good morning to our students. Good morning to our auxiliary staff. I welcome everyone to our last day of orientation. And how have you guys been enjoying our session so far? I've been seeing a lot of really good feedback. Let's see in the chats some of your favorite sessions. I, we tried our best to mix up our topics. You seem great, so fun. I want to just remind everyone to take a minute at the end of your session today to just fill out our survey link. There'll be two links. One would be from our faculty survey, and the next would be a link from the Division of Student Services where we just gauge how you guys enjoyed our sessions. We got some feedback. PBL sessions are amazing. That's good to hear because, you know, PBL plays such an important role in your first three years of schooling. So as, as we talk about PBL, I also would like to talk about PEC. And with us this morning, we have Dr. Batalami. He's one of our lecturers over at the CMSC department, and he's going to talk a bit about ethics and professionalism in the PEC course. So Dr. Batalami, good morning and welcome to our orientation. Morning, Rihanna. Thanks very much for the introduction and good morning to all present and um, especially the 200, 302 participants that I see have joined the waiting room. So it's quite a lot, um, very daunting. <laughs> um, okay, well, let me begin by saying good morning to the students. Um, uh, I hope that you have enough energy to carry on to this final day of orientation, as Rihanna mentioned. Um, I know after five days that you must be exhausted and, and excited in equal measure. And you can't really be bothered with orientation sessions because all you really want to do is go and crack open your brand new textbooks and start reading. Um, and that's understandable, um, but I just want to crave your attention for about, um, about 10 minutes. I won't keep you for as long as 15 minutes because um, I know you're very eager to, to um, start enjoying your Friday and start on Monday. So anyway, on behalf of the PEC program, I'd like to welcome you to the Faculty of Medical Sciences. And um, I'll just be talking to you about the next 10 minutes or so. Um, so PEC is an acronym for Professionalism, Ethics and Communication Health. And historically, topics like this have always been regarded by students as a kind of soft subject compared to the, the glitz and the glamour of anatomy and physiology and biochemistry that you'll be doing. Um, but I can tell you in my experience as a medical professional of over 20 years, um, I can assure you that as you advance in your career, most of, the, of these gl glitzy subjects will be forgotten. You'll be forgotten. You'll forget 70% of your anatomy, 80% of your physiology, all these glucose 6-phosphatase dehydrogenase pathways you're going to have to learn, and your, and your sodium potassium pumps. You'll forget all of these. And the only thing that's left is medicine and practicing professionalism, ethics, and communication for the rest of your career. And in Trinidad retirement, it is around 60. So you can look forward to practicing these PEC principles for the next 40 years of your life, right? So it's worth taking some, some interest in. So uh, for an example, the pharmacists among you, we sometimes be asked to dispense drugs without a prescription. Oh gosh, you know, I kind of short this month, I daily paid, I ain't get paid today. Just give me it and I'll give it back the money later on. Now. Is, is, is this ethical? Is it professional? The optometrists and the vets among you will be asked by drug companies to promote medications that are untested. But the drugs, I swear, is the drugs are the best things in sliced bread, right? The dentist among your patient will come with a huge dental abscess that will eventually lead to airway obstruction. But they'll say, Doc, I don't, don't, don't come anywhere near me with that knife. I don't want to um, have this operation. What are you going to do in that case? You'll have some of you have to tell patients that they have a serious or terminal illness or that a loved one has just passed, especially in this, um, in this period of COVID um, that's going on now. Do, how, do you come, how does this come across? How do you deliver these news to the patients? You just blit it out and hope for the best. And I'm 100% sure that there are people in the audience, the 304 among you who have seen medical professionals dispense bad news to a family member and you've been present and you've thought to yourself, but wait now, this, the way this doctor be doing this, this bad news, there's something not right here, you know, something not quite right. And as an aside, I'll tell you that the majority of medical complaints and legal cases stem from a lack of communication. So I don't really want to see any of you on the wrong end of a lawsuit, right? So at this point now, I'd just like to emphasize that you are not medical, you are not secondary school students anymore. And as new students in the Faculty of Medical Sciences, you are now all professionals. And I want to emphasize that again, you're all professionals now. 
And this applies whether you're a medical student, whatever school you're going to, you signed up for medical student, dental student, optometry student, pharmacy or vet. And as soon as you put on that white coat, you'll find that people will treat you very, very differently from before. And even people who haven't known you for years, your neighbors will be coming up to you and asking for medical advice suddenly because they know you're in medical school. And as far as they're concerned, you're in medical school, you're a doctor, you could give them advice, right? So in, in medieval and Elizabethan England, there were organizations called guilds. And these guilds were a collection of artisans and tradesmen whose purpose was to regulate the quality of workmanship, the training of new members, and to provide support for their members. And there were guilds for virtually every trade they could think of, from spec from glasses makers to armorers. And back then, it was a really a mark of great prestige to belong to a guild, either as a member or as a fully fledged, apprentice, a fully fledged member or as an apprentice. And in much the same way, it is now very considered very prestigious to be a professional. So I would like you all to kind of stop thinking of yourselves as secondary school students and as think of yourselves as now belonging to a guild. But even though being a professional attracts a certain amount of prestige before you start congratulating yourself and patting yourself on the back, I must now tell you that in return, society expects certain things from you. And as professionals, it behooves you to behave in a particular fashion, not just in your practice, but in public as well. And this semester, Dr. Youssef, he's one of my colleagues. He's a one of the lecturers on the PEC courses as well. And you have tutors. They will teach you about something called a social contract that you now have with society. And very briefly, the social contract, this is an unwritten contract that you have now entered into with society. So in return for certain benefits that society grants you because of your professional status, you are now expected to behave in an altruistic, a humanitarian, and an ethical manner. And even your behavior online needs to reflect your professional status. And we'll talk about prof online professionalism in second semester too. So the point I'm trying to make is that society does not owe you anything. So let me repeat that, society does not owe you anything, but rather because of your professional status, it is the other way around. And but for many years in Trinidad, I'm sure you know by now this scenario has been reversed. So, so much so that the public perception of medical professionals now is very, very low. And as a guild, as a, as a profession, we are seen as very greedy, very grasping, and only beholden to the almighty dollar, right? So it's, a very, it's a, my sincerest hope that reversing this trend will start with you guys. And then I made a brief mention of communication. So as long as recognizing your commitments as professionals, communication is one of the skills that is most taken for granted but it's also one of the most difficult to acquire. And I can hear some of you thinking about how hard can it be to ask your patients some questions? But trust me when I tell you, it's not as easy as it seems. And it's not just about asking patients questions. I've been a doctor for over 20 years and I still have my challenges when it comes to patients. And communication is not merely limited to asking the patient a history, how you're feeling, where you're hurting, um, how much you're hurting, um, on a scale of one to 10, give me a, a, a rating. It impacts hugely in other ways, including patient recovery, patient satisfaction, patient diagnosis. And you have to take communication, you have to take into account lots of variables like race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, mental illness. And communication not just limited to your patients, you have to learn how to communicate with your peers as well. And with the current pandemic kind of swirling among us, telemedicine is something that will assume greater importance in the future. Right, so at this point here ended my lecture about the, the professionalism, the ethics and the communication bit. But before I go, I would just like to give you two pieces of advice based on my experience as a medical student who went to UE. So the first piece of advice I want to give you all is to temper your expectations. Many of you will be accustomed to achieving very, very high marks throughout your secondary school career. But the volume of work that faces you now is unlike any that you have previously come across and I promise you is a massive culture shock. And I have personally seen a few of my colleagues in medical school have to take time off because of stress and mental illness in an effort to maintain those high standards. And sometimes it's not possible. I mean, by all means, put your best foot forward in your studies, but give yourself a break if you get a B or a C instead of an A. High marks now in your preclinical years don't necessarily translate into being a good doctor, a good dentist, a good optometrist, or a good pharmacist, okay? So that's my first piece of advice. The second piece of advice is to talk to people and don't isolate yourself. And it's even more important during the period of COVID. The course can be very, very stressful for some people and everybody responds differently to pressure. And if you find that suddenly you are this type A personality where you're a high, a high flying achiever and then suddenly you're not coping, don't be a hero, right? Talk to a friend how you're not coping, how, how it's a struggle. Talk to a family member, talk to you, you all have mentors, talk to your mentors or talk to your lecturers, they're all very approachable. And you'll be very, very surprised when you talk to people that find that you're not the only one in the boat, in this boat, right? 
Okay, so that's it for me. Thanks for your attention. Anybody has any questions? So, excuse me, I have a question. Um, so, for, um, what's your name? Sorry. Well, my name is Dwight. I have a question. For example, for okay. and lecture, like during the week now, how exactly would they, would they be scheduled? You mean for all the courses or the PEC courses? The PEC course, sorry. Oh, which school, which school do you belong to? Um, the School of Dentistry. Okay, so lectures are usually from 8 to 9 on Tuesday mornings. And then um, if you're in the School of Dentistry, you'll have tutorials either on Mondays or Wednesdays from 10 to 12. So you could choose the days or you have some... No, so, the, so the MBBS students are on one day and the non-MBBS students are on the other day. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, Rihanna, well, that's it for me. Yeah, I'm not seeing any other questions at this point in time. Students, I have a question for students. Have you all been able to access your timetables on our FMS website? Yes, we have. Okay, so everyone has received it, right? I know it's a little complex to read at first, but eventually you'll realize that it's divided by the different schools, the different programs, and it was based on you know, the fact that it may have been face-to-face. -face. So you, where, for example, you would see that you may have a lecture in the amphitheater, you just have to know now that it's going to be online and the um, course convener would send you the necessary links for the class, right, to the group reps, especially with PBL. So if you do have any um, issues with the timetable, you can also feel free to email me. Um, I am seeing your message asking to go through the timetable. However, it may take way too long if I start that now. So feel free to reach out to me after orientation. I also do want to remind you that our recordings will be made available. I know there are students who may have joined in um, late, they may have registered late, they may not have received the link in time, whatever the issue, connectivity issues, um, all our recordings from next week will be available on our UEFYE um, YouTube page. I will also be sending out the links to class reps. I will also be having it on our FMS website, right? Now we try to keep our website up to date as much as possible. So anytime you look into timetables, PBL forms, anything related to academic advising, student resources, we have our entire website dedicated to a whole segment for students and student resources. So I encourage you to go there and look for whatever you may find that you are missing, right? Um, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties with our next presenter in joining in. So I just would like to ask you all to bear with me for a few minutes while we sort out that issue. Um, we saw some of the advantages and disadvantages to Zoom. One of the disadvantages to Zoom is internet connectivity, right? So I hope for classes, wherever you guys are, you make sure you have, you know, adequate internet if it's given trouble. I mean, there's nothing you could do about it. There are minor things such as switching off your webcam to help, you know, pr um, preserve some of your bandwidth, stuff like that. So make sure that, you know, when you have important exams or important classes, we try our best to make sure that there's minimal interruptions unless it's really, really out of our control, then which we will be understanding. Okay, Dr. Batalmi, we'll see you. Thank you again for our okay, no problem. this morning. Have a good day, guys. Okay. I am here, uh, Miss Diana. Right, so students, Prof. Saar is with us this morning. I would also like to take this opportunity, Prof. Saar, for helping us with this orientation, to put everything together, for helping with your lectures, everything of that sort. Um, it was well appreciated and well received by all of our students. They expressed their thanks throughout this entire orientation week. They find it was such a good week. It was. Everything went smoothly. Students have been commenting about that nonstop all week. So I'm very proud of that. In the interim, I am going to send the link that, as I promised, regarding our survey form. Here it is. It's also on our orientation schedule on 
the bottom where it says Friday, it has feedback survey link. So if you have a copy of the program, you can get it there or you can access it here. And you can just take a couple of minutes to fill it out. Um, if you have feedback pertaining to which session you enjoyed, what you think we could do different, please feel free to let us know, okay? I know some of you guys really enjoyed our mental health segment as well. That was really good to note. One of the things the faculty really likes to take pride in is making sure that, you know, we have a, a mix, that we're not just going to be studying medicine alone where we're doing all around things, you know, and if it is you find that it's being too overwhelming and you need to reach out for counseling services, you know, we, we have that available over with CAPS. Uh, Mr. So, you have a question. Let's hear it. You can unmute your mic and I can try my best to answer. Hopefully, um, good morning, Mr. Um, concerning the class reps, right? What right. do we do to how do we have to contact you concerning that? Did Melissa speak about that on yesterday? I can't remember. Did she say anything? Uh, I can't remember either. Okay, so what you can do, send me an email. I know I keep telling you guys that, but sometimes it's hard to multitask. I do probably need to ask a couple of questions. The student affairs are usually different from the office affairs. So I'm not sure the voting process as to how the class reps, you know, how they vote for them and how they select them. But I do know that once you do have a class rep designated, you have to inform me so that that way I can communicate with you guys, okay? Okay. So, um, sorry about that. So, Ms. Dairam from Student Services has also sent a brief survey about the orientation. So, I would also ask that you take a moment. I know we don't want to feel like we're giving you too much service to do, but we do have a short wait time while we try to get assistance from Ms. Pilgrim to connect, right? I'll be back again in one minute while you guys complete that survey. Good morning everyone. I've resorted to recording my presentation because I'm having technical difficulties. Professor, thank you for inviting me to do this presentation on professionalism, which is especially important in the health sector at this particular time, where we are all facing a pandemic. And as we see debt tolls rising, professionalism is especially, especially in the health sector, is of paramount importance because it can often mean the difference between life or death. Now, professionalism, I'm sure, is dear to each and every one of us because we can give experiences of where we felt that someone was not being professional, their behavior was unprofessional, or they were not display, displaying professionalism in practice. So it is also to me, and I have had the opportunity to observe many persons over the years, and, and then I made my own, um, my own judgment, right? Um, and we also seem to have a challenge in our culture and therefore this topic, Professor, is extremely important to each and every one of us as we strive for improvement in the healthcare sector. Now, um, my first slide had points to ponder. So as we start, I want to ask, ask each and every one of you, why are you here? Have you taken time to think of why you are in this profession at this time or why you have chosen this profession? That would determine the way you behave. Are you passionate about your chosen path or not? Did somebody force you to come into this or not? Now you need to answer these questions for yourself. And also, how does our culture view professionalism? Is it positively, negatively? Do we display professionalism in our culture? What do you think about your own level of professionalism? Are there consequences for unprofessional behavior in our culture? Are you satisfied with the level of professionalism you experience from others? 
No, professionalism means something to each and every one of us who work in healthcare, well, actually in every sector. Being an inspiring role model, working in the best interest of people in your care, regardless of what position you hold and where you deliver care, is what really brings practice and behavior together in harmony. Now, my next slide was a quote from um, Mahatma Gandhi. Be the change that you wish to see in the world. If you are dissatisfied with what you see, and, and the answer to the questions that I posed before would determine your response to this. So, do you think that we need to change? Then you be the change that you want to see. There are many definitions for professionalism. Now, the Mary, Merriam Webster Dictionary um, defines it as the conduct aims and qualities that characterize or mark a profession or a professional person. A calling requiring specialized knowledge and often long and intensive academic preparations. Behend et al. says a chosen paid occupation that requires a prolonged training and formal qualifications. But something else that it pointed out which I'm going to read to you. It says is professionalism is solely intrinsic to an individual and is an expression of oneself through attitudes and behavior. So when we're talking about professionalism, attitudes and behaviors are very important. And also, as in Merriam Webster, it says they conduct the aims or qualities that characterizes a professional. There's a quote by Shiv Kira, which says, professionalism, it's not the job you do, it's how you do the job. So if you take nothing else away from today's presentation, think of how you do your job. That defines professionalism. Professionalism in clinical practice has been described as how we justify the trust of patients colleagues and community to do the right thing in the right way for the right reason and in a timely manner. Now, our patients rely on us and sometimes our colleagues too, but they rely on us and the way we respond will determine whether they trust us or not. We must recognize that patients have rights and as healthcare providers, we have corresponding obligations to our patients. Obligations meaning to do that which is morally and legally right. I want us to take note that in clinical practice, good patient care is the core of the job. Good patient care. And that would determine how we are viewed. The people will say whether we are professional or not. It's actually our solemn duty and responsibility to gain the patient and societal trust. And how do we do that? In our practice, we cannot do things haphazardly. We need to have proper procedures and policies. We need to have values that underpin our practice. For instance, like respect for others, self-respect, honesty, integrity. Also, we need to look at the attitudes and, and, and behaviors that, uh, that define or underpin professionalism. Putting our patients' interests first. That's why we said here is the core of the job and maintaining standards of care at all times. Now, some commitments that are central to professionalism in healthcare are like advocacy, compassion, communication, cultural sensitivity, ethical practice, integrity and honesty, work in partnership, and reflective practice. If you were to choose three, what would be your top three? I would just talk about a couple, about three. 
advocacy. Now, advocacy, we've heard the word bandied about so many times, and we need to advocate on behalf of our clients, and even sometimes on behalf of our colleagues. So when we are interacting with, with um, clients, we need to um, not bring down our our colleagues we need to represent them so you know and the same way when we are um seeing our clients like say for instance a doctor and a nurse you're seeing a client together um the nurse should show respect to the doctor and the doctor should show respect to the nurse and if there is something that the doctor says um that does not really get the client's need across then the, the nurse's role is to advocate on behalf of that client. Each of us, in whatever field we are in, as a pharmacist, a, a, a physiotherapist, whatever, we need to advocate on behalf of our clients. And sometimes we would also have to advocate on behalf of our colleagues. Because as we said um, before, that professionalism can be described as how we justify the trust of our patients and our colleagues and our community. Also communication. And communication is not only what you say, you know, but it's how you say it. And, and also your body language. Because sometimes you might be saying something that is not bad, but your body language shows to the client or to your colleagues that you just don't care. And also cultural sensitivity, which I think is really important, especially now in our culture where we have so many different cultures who are part of, of the Trinidad and Tobago landscape. So um, we need to be culturally sensitive. You know, we have a lot of Venezuelans here with us and we need to be cognizant of the fact that um, they are probably here to stay, but regardless of that, um, how do we speak to them? We know that English is not their first language. Do we just ramble on? You need to slow down, you need to take time so that they can understand, so that they can develop trust in us. So that is it also important. Let's, let's move on. Um, enablers of organization, organizational professionalism. Now, in order for us to have, um, for professionalism, So be good at what you do and remember that a professional is someone who can do his best work when he doesn't feel like it. So your feelings has nothing to do with it. You may be having a bad day, but when your patient who is the core reason why we are here, we treat them with respect and dignity. Also, and um, as I said before, patient care is the core of our job. And also, the last thing, Shiv Kira said, professionalism is not the job you do, it's how you do your job. So go out there and be the best professional Trinidad and Tobago can ever have. Thank you.
have five more minutes open to any more questions you guys may have until we take a little recess. I have, I see one of our presenters has logged on. He is Dr. Moore. Dr. Moore, good morning and welcome to our orientation. Hi, good morning. Nice to Ready see you. Ready and waiting. Great. So we will be starting with our breakout rooms at 10 a.m. and our students will be going on a short recess in a few minutes. And then I will introduce our presenters at about 5 to 10, where, right before our breakout session starts. Okay, no problem. Great. So let me check. Question. Okay, I have one question. Let's hear it, Faith. I hope I can answer. Good morning. I was Good wondering morning. if there's a deadline for submitting documents to get the ID card. The ID card. I have to once again find out. I don't think there's a deadline, but the UE ID card office, let me get an email address for you. Would best be able to answer that one. Great. So idcard.help at sta.ue.edu, right? Um, ID cards are very important, even though everyone is doing online schooling right now. Clinical students, it's mandatory, right? They have, um, they have to be out on the wards, which eventually you will have to do when you reach year four. And of course, they don't let you on wards without your ID card. So that's very, very important to note, right? When ID cards are misplaced, there's also a cost attached to it. And, you know, you can try to avoid having that, right? You would also require a new ID card depending on the program that you are in. If you had an ID card from a former program, you need to have it revised and, you know, for it to require a replacement, a new, a new ID card, sorry. Right, um, someone is asking me about credits. Once again, I would encourage you to send me an email on that matter. So that way I can respond to you individually with regards to credits, right? Hi, um, I have a question. Sure. Um, so with the ID card, right? I did N1 before and I have an ID card from that. So I have right. to get a new one. Yes. How do I get an ID card like um, revised? Okay, so you can send an, an email to the same address that I just sent in the chat, idcard.help at sd.ue.edu. And you can ask them, remember, the ID card is a total separate entity from my portfolio, right? So I'm just trying to assist as best as I can by directing you directly to them. They can answer all your questions. They would, able, they would be able to tell you the process. If you have to submit your photo via email, how do you collect it? They would be able to give you the full round now, right? So just send them. <laughs> I never got my ID from pre -styled. Okay, well, please make sure you get it for FMS this time, right? And that means I have to pay the fee for ID card when I'm paying my fees for bread since I am um, getting a new one. Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Sure. I hope I answered it as best as I could. Good morning, Miss. Uh, one question concerning the ID card, right? Um, I did a, a career degree before. Would my ID card still be valid? Because I think I heard that it's valid for five years or something like that. I'm not too sure. But I know I had to pay for a new one when I was registering for this new yeah. degree. Yeah, you may have to very well pay um, pay for that new one and use that new ID card to reflect that you are a student of the Faculty of Medical Sciences. So I have to resubmit yeah. a new photo and everything. Yeah, you can, before you go down all that route, you know, still send them an email and find out if they require what they require, you know, if it is the... Yes, I did send them an email, but they said... Um, Something with if you have financial clearance, the card would be valid. But to email Boostery to find out if I have to pay for anyone, and Boostery email has. So when you email them to get the the information, they told you you needed financial clearance, and you had financial clearance. Yeah, so that the card would be, I guess, reactivated or something like that. 
Okay, you could always send me an email as well after this session and let's see how we can take it from there, right? Okay. Because I know they do take long to respond, their inbox is full, you know, we're getting it left, right and center, but it's a lot to just make sure that we manage and make sure everybody gets attended to. They will be attended to, but in due time, right? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm getting some private messages here about exemption from classes. Um, if, if that is the case and you want to discuss your exemption, I would encourage you to reach out to Mrs. Patterson Coombs. Um, she can discuss more. She's our senior AA, as I mentioned, um, regarding registration and those matters, which also includes exemption, right? Um, can a completed caution refund form be submitted with the registration documents to the bursary in place of paying for caution? I believe, I believe to the best of my ability that the caution fee is mandatory. I'm not sure about the caution refund form. I know when students usually exit the program, they submit the forms to the office of the dean that we stamp and they go and they get back their, their caution refund. Right. Any other questions that I may be able to answer? Now, remember, guys, I work for the deputy deans at FMS, so as much as I would love to answer every, every question, I may not be able to do so, right? With respect to pay installments, can we pay online with a debit card? I am trying, but I am having difficulties. Is this the pay installments for your funding, for, for your tuition funding? Free, free pay. Okay. That one, I'm not sure about the debit card. Is it a visa debit card? Because I've, I'm not seeing a problem if it is that they allow you to pay with a visa debit card. No? Okay. And another question, what about parking passes? What's the process if we do need one? Well, right now, employees and students are not allowed on campus unless um, they have mandatory classes that they have to take for examinations. So I do not believe that parking passes are issued this time. It is usually done through the head of security, um, UE security that is, and you have to submit your information to them. Um, let me see if I can find the website. And you can apply on the website as well, right? UE Security Parking Permits. Found it. And those of you who wish to apply can do so, right? Now, all I did was I searched up the UE security. They have staff and they have students. Make sure you select student. Make sure you select your student ID number and you take it from there. Okay, students. So I hope I may have answered some of your questions as best as I can. Um, with respect to the gate, I contacted them. I believe last week I was told the status of my application is currently at UE waiting to be processed for a while. Can you give any updates to when these applications would be processed? I can advise you to once again check in with Mrs. Vicklin Patterson Coombs with information regarding gate, as well as academic holes or any sort of financial clearance. Okay, guys, so we have about five minutes to go until 10 o'clock. I welcome all our presenters and facilitators for the next hour who are with us. Um, of course, some of these talks may be less than an hour. However, I do advise about the breakout room sessions. So as mentioned, you're going to receive a link shortly that will direct you to the room that you wish to enter. The room that you are going to enter is based on your program. So all medical students who are studying medicine will be entering into the MBBS room. For dentistry, we have the DDS. For veterinary students, we have the DVM. 
And once in that room, you would then be introduced to your different presenters. Now, our presenters are here with us this morning. Good morning to every one of you guys who have joined us for our orientation. And I do thank you. I would just like to introduce everyone briefly, just to say a hello before we separate and go our ways into different Zooms. So we do have from the Medical Board of Trans Tobago, Dr. Leslie Ann Roberts. Good morning, Ms. Robert, Dr. Roberts. Good morning and it's thanks for inviting me. A pleasure to have you here. I hope that I'm being heard properly and I also hope that uh, I can share my screen with the students and you'll give me some directions as to how to do that. Definitely. You have been assigned as a co-host and all our co-hosts have the privilege to share their screens. Okay, thank right? you. Sure. And I introduced him a little while ago, Dr. Moore. Welcome again. Thank you for joining us in our orientation this morning. Hi, good morning, and thank you for inviting me to make a presentation. Yes, Dr. Moore is our representative of the Dental Council of Trinidad and Tobago. And likewise, I might need help in sharing screen. I've been practicing, but uh, well, sure. I hope it works works well for me. So you have also been assigned as a co-host and hopefully it shall all go smoothly. Okay. Next up, we also have Dr. Paul Crooks, who is our representative of the T&T Optometry Association. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I'm actually the representative of the Trinidad and Tobago Veterinary Association. Oh, sorry. They have <laughs> Okay, so welcome to orientation this morning. Sorry about that. Thank you very much for having me and I will try to do my best. I should be able to, to share screens and so on. I'll do what I can. <laughs> I'll make right. it work. Sure, you are also a co-host. So once you have that authority to share your screen, you shall be able to do so. We also have Ms. Vandana Fassad. Good morning, Ms. Fassad. Hi, good morning. I'm very happy to be here as well. And thank you for selecting me to be a speaker today. Okay, great. So we look forward to hearing our optometry students to hearing your presentation this morning as well. Next up, we also have Ms. Karen Frank. Good morning, Ms. Frank. Are you hearing us all well? Yes, good morning. I'm hearing. Welcome to our orientation. I do note you have been with us from the start and I thank you for that. Our students are looking forward to your presentation for all nursing students shortly. Ms. Frank is a representative of the Trinidad and Tobago Registered Nurses Association. Finally, I have last but not least, Professor Surendra Arjun. Good morning, Prof, and how are you? Good, thank you. Um... I'm a little nervous because I'm on my iPad. Should oh, I go, and I, I'll need help to move the, the slides. Should I go on my computer or stay on the iPad? Uh, you, you have your presentation on the computer? No, I, I sent, well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I have it on my um, laptop. Should I go on my laptop? You can, stay, you, can, you, can stay, you can stay where you are and I can try to upload and help navigate for you, okay? Okay. I hope your Indian goddess with 30 hands, yeah, because I think, I don't know how many you're going to do. We only have thing. two at this point in time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But thank you, and it's nice to see some colleagues. Yes, nice yes. Anybody in this time, you know, so all those okay. two-dimensional, but that, that could work for me too. <laughs> all our pharmacy students this morning yeah right thanks yeah so so are we ready to set up our zoom breakout sessions lana yes we are so i do wish you guys a great session ahead you all are going to learn a lot about ethics and professionalism we know the importance of it right in our everyday life so I now invite you to go into your designated Zoom room where you would be able to interact with your presenter and learn more about ethics and professionalism. Okay, students, so I see that most of the breakout sessions have ended and you guys are back 
on the chat with us. Once again, I wish to take this opportunity to thank all our presenters who were here during the course of the week. Special thanks to the Division of Stu Student Services, Ms. Diaram and Mr. Talisford for assisting us with all our Zoom sessions and coordinating. Special thanks to Ms. Siobhan Badu for assisting me throughout this process. And I take this, this opportunity to wish you all a very safe and productive day. We'll have some lunch and we look forward to having you over at the Faculty of Medical Sciences. Do take care and enjoy your day.